Greetings, fellow aliens. Welcome to the 18th episode of Earthlings 101. In past episodes, we learned about Earthlings' sustenation, emotions and rituals. Today we will discuss a domain where all three points overlap, beverages. First, a question to my alien viewers, imagine you have a brain implant and a remote control with two buttons. The first button makes you a bit of an idiot, but a happy one, who doesn't realize he's being an idiot. The more you press it, the more idiotic your thoughts and behavior will get, until your motor functions fail, but you won't care, because you're an idiot. Eventually, your brain will shut down. Would you use this button? The second button blocks the signal that tells your brain when your body is exhausted. Even if your body is screaming at your brain that it needs rest, your brain won't realize, so you can continue working. In a nutshell, this button makes you a productive sucker. Would you press this button voluntarily? I'm asking because some beverages have a similar effect on earthlings, some make you a happy idiot, some a productive sucker. And, strangely, earthlings enjoy them, especially in groups. Go figure. But more about this later. Earthlings consume beverages for four basic reasons, sustenation, cooling, rituals, and hacking their own brains. The latter two seem to be quite important for understanding Earthling civilization. But more on that later, let's start with the basics, sustenation and cooling. Life on Earth is based on hydric acid, also known as water, a universal solvent, toxic to many alien life forms. Earthlings need water to maintain their metabolism and many other things, including temperature regulation, the thing that makes them so good runners. We talked about this in episode 16. In consequence, water is the most basic beverage. However, Earthlings can't drink seawater, they need water without sodium chloride, which can be found in rain and bodies of flowing water. Clear, cold water seems to be one of their favorites, Earthlings find that refreshing. Warm, and polluted water is less popular. Cold water is the most popular beverage on Earth. It comes either out of wells, elaborate pipe systems, or is bought in bottles. But why do Earthlings like their water cold rather than warm? I think there are two reasons for this. The first one is that water is used for cooling, and that works better with cold water. The second reason is that stagnant, warm, muddy water from ponds or swamps is likely infested with microbes. Fresh spring water is a much safer choice because microbes don't like it, it's too cold, too unsteady, and there's not much to eat in it. So, earthlings have evolved to like clear, cold drinks. Bonus points if there's gas like CO2 dissolved in it, because when spring water is full of little bubbles, you can be sure it's not stagnant. Natural sparkling water has been popular since antiquity, especially when it contains some minerals. One of the best known mineral waters comes from Celtas in Germany. That's where the word seltzer comes from. It was only some hundred years ago that earthlings found out how to carbonate water. It was originally sold as a quack remedy, as a supposed cure for scurvy. What happens when sparkling water enters the mouth? Well, an enzyme in the saliva called carbonic anhydrase transforms the CO2 into an acid, which triggers the sour receptors. Scientific advice, you might wonder what exactly is perceived as refreshing, the acid or the little bubbles. That's easy to find out. When you increase the cabin pressure before serving carbonated water to earthlings, there will be no bubbles, but the drink will still be refreshing. On the other hand, if you give earthlings carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, a medication mountain climbers use, the carbon dioxide is not transformed into acid and the drink, bubbly or not, tastes like dishwater. Water is not the first beverage newborn earthlings drink. That would usually be milk, a protein-rich drink produced by female earthlings. Adult earthlings like to drink cow's milk, a similar beverage produced by cattle, but not every earthling can digest it. Another popular drink is juice. It comes from fruit, those colorful sugar packages plants produce to bribe animals into carrying their seeds around. Fruit juice contains water, sugar and other useful stuff like vitamins. Its taste is generally a mix of sweet and sour. I guess that's why earthlings perceive sourness as refreshing. We talked about sugar in the episode about food. 
Sugar is the main energy source for the body. C. The metabolism runs on some kind of nano batteries called ATP. Empty batteries consist of adenosine, an odd molecule with a pentagon and a hexagon smushed together. ATP is the same thing but with three phosphate groups pinned to one end. Those phosphate groups don't want to be there, so you get energy when you release them. To recharge them, you need energy. That energy comes mainly from sugar, and to get it you need to burn it with oxygen. That's why earthlings eat and breathe. Nobody can charge ATP batteries without oxygen. Except for, the microbes. <laughs> That's why earthlings love sugary drinks. Bonus points when they are also cold, bubbly, and have a sour or fruity taste, that's basically what Earthlings call soda, another popular drink. By the way, some modern soda brands like 7up and Dr Pepper were originally sold as quack remedies, the former as an antidepressant, the latter to help digestion, and as a stimulant. But now let's get to the more interesting drinks, those which mess with people's brains and are extensively used in rituals. Let's start with what Earthlings call booze. There are microorganisms called yeast able to charge ATP batteries without any oxygen, only with sugar, that's called fermentation. The byproducts of fermentation are CO2 bubbles and, more importantly, a tiny molecule called alcohol. You know alcohol, of course, you do. The Milky Way contains huge clouds of alcohol, for example, Sagittarius B2, the giant cloud of booze near the galactic center, the source of what you know as Sagittarian brandy. For Earthlings, it smells like raspberry-flavored rum, probably due to a molecule called ethyl formate. Earthlings love alcohol because it messes with their brains. The molecule is so tiny that it gets in the way of all sorts of brain processes. If you are an alien with a carbon-based chemical brain, you will not be surprised. But Earthling will tell you that their brains run based on electrical signals, like their computers. How can a molecule mess with that? Maybe you shouldn't take that comparison with electronic computers too seriously. Earthlings love to pretend their brains work just like one of their contractions. In antiquity, they imagined the brain as a hydraulic automaton running on four kinds of liquids, yellow bile, black bile, blood, and slime. In the 17th century, they compared it with a mechanical clockwork. Later, they thought it was like a telegraph network or telephone switchboard, and modern Earthlings compare it to an electrical computer. Those metaphors influence how they think about the brain, and they all are flawed. None of those metaphors takes into account how much the working of the brain is influenced by chemicals, which, by the way, are closely linked to emotions. Even earthling AIs, which try to reproduce the workings of the brain, generally don't simulate brain chemistry. And as long as earthlings keep it that way, AIs will never be driven by emotions and will never pursue personal goals, let alone strive for world dominance. But I digress. Personally, I like to compare the earthling brain to an orgy of Sargassian swamp sirens. See, a single siren is pretty dumb, barely capable of sustaining itself. That's why sirens organize themselves in collectives called houses, where they communicate with electrical signals. A house develops its own group mind with a rudimentary intelligence, like an Arcturian anthill or a bureaucratic institution. Now, sometimes, a number of siren houses decide to meet for an orgy, a wild exchange of bodily fluids and electrical stimuli, self-organizing into a semi-hierarchic system of complex stimulus networks, and enhanced with music and intoxicating smokes. Orgies can become highly intelligent pretty fast. A typical orgy takes about 57 standard galactic clock cycles to come to the conclusion that it exists, 91 cycles to develop basic quantum mechanics, 177 cycles to find the meaning of life, and 293 cycles to decide if cereal is a soup. Now, an earthling's brain works pretty much the same, the music is incoming sensory input. The stimuli are electrical signals. The bodily fluids are neurotransmitters, chemicals that literally bridge the gap between neurons. The fumes are hormones like adrenaline or dopamine, they are closely linked to emotions and influence how the brain and the body work. Now, what happens when alcohol enters the room? Well, those tiny molecules really get the party going. By messing with the neurotransmitter GABA, they slow down thought processes. They also boost some hormones, adrenaline, norepinephrine and cortisol act as stimulants, endorphins and dopamine create the sensation of pleasure, that's the reward system I mentioned in another episode. The result is a strange but often pleasurable happy idiot state between excitement and relaxation, paired with a loss of inhibition and, eventually, a gradual shutdown of brain functions. This is called, drunkenness. Earthlings love messing with their brains, especially when the reward system is involved. 
They love it even more in social events, rituals. We discussed rituals in another episode, they play a central role in earthling society, and they often involve alcoholic beverages. I will come back to that later. The central idea of making alcoholic beverages is always the same, you need yeast, plus the yeast's favorite food, sugar water. You have the yeast ferment the sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide, and then you fill it into barrels or bottles. Maybe the simplest beverages based on this principle are fruit wine, made of fruit juice, and mead, made out of water and honey. Those beverages have existed since prehistoric times. Archaeologists have found the remains of a 13,000 solar cycles old brewery in a prehistoric cave in Israel. In China, they found 9,000-year-old pottery with remains of an alcoholic beverage made of grapes, honey, berries and rice. This seems to indicate that in both regions, alcoholic beverages predate agriculture. There is even a theory that earthlings adopted agriculture so they could make more booze. That's earthlings for you. Mind-altering drugs can of course be used for military purposes. The Vikings, for example, had elite warriors, so-called berserkers, who used mead with mind-altering herbs to get into a murderous frenzy. Strategic advice. When confronting earthling troops on the battlefield, you might be tempted to boost your shock troops with similar alcoholic combat drugs. But don't overdo it, or else your alien berserkers might attack your own troops. You can replace the sugar water with carbs, say, crushed cereals with water. Although yeast prefers sugar, it will half-heartedly ferment other kinds of carbs. You will get some alcohol and some CO2 bubbles. If the mixture is a sticky paste, you get a dough with bubbles in it. You can bake it in an oven, the little bit of alcohol evaporates, the bubbles expand, and you get bread. But if it's more or less liquid, and you use a little trick to convince the yeast really feast on your cereals, you get a bubbly alcoholic beverage called beer. We will come back to that little trick in a minute. Beer is one of the oldest alcoholic beverages. In ancient Sumer, beer was served warm and fresh in jars covered by a yeast cake. You pierced the cake with straws and drank it, often two or more persons per jar. These straws could be simple weeds or ornate artifacts, which seems to indicate that these drinking rituals were considered important. In Sumer and Egypt, beer was consumed daily and used as currency. The Pyramid of Giza was constructed by workers paid with bread and beer. To this day, construction workers enjoying a refreshing beer are not an unusual sight. Beer, as we know it today, is typically created out of barley, water, yeast, and bitter seed cones called hops. The problem is that yeast is a spoiled brat who won't create a decent booze out of the carbon hydrates in the barley, it demands sugar. So you need an extra step to break down the carbon hydrates into sugar, the barley is first soaked in water and allowed to germinate, during which it produces digestive enzymes. It is then dried at a high temperature, so the germination stops. The result is called malt, it is crushed and mixed with water. Now the enzymes begin their work and break the carbon hydrates down into sugar. The resulting sugary water is boiled with hops to add flavor, filtered, and cooled down. Now we can add the yeast and have it ferment the sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. When the fermentation is done, it's filled into casks or bottles, ready to be consumed. Today, beer is widely popular all over the world. It is typically consumed during informal social gatherings often in establishments called pubs which serve beer right out of the barrel. Back to fruit wine. The by far most popular fruit wine is made out of grapes, it's commonly just called wine. Wine production goes back about 8,000 years. In Mesopotamia, it was called mountain beer and was reserved for the elite. But it really took off in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, roughly 4 to 3 millennia ago. In ancient Greece, wine was usually mixed with water, drinking undiluted wine was seen as uncultivated. Wine drinking rituals were called symposia, a place where men, and only men, used to talk of things and ships and elements, of triangles and kings, and why the sun is boiling hot, and where the gods have wings. Alcohol, when consumed in moderation, makes conversations more vivid. One could argue that the golden age of Greco-Roman antiquity was, in a certain way, fueled by wine. Today, wine is popular all over the world. It's generally more expensive than beer and considered more cultivated. Wine is often served in combination with sophisticated food. Alcohol played and plays a strong role in many religions. Stories from all over the planet tell us of gods enjoying alcohol, just like any mortal. There's even a Norse myth about the wise god Odin doing a booze heist, to get the mead of poetry. 
Wine and beer also appear in religious rituals, for example, as offerings for the gods in Egyptian and Mesopotamian rituals. Getting drunk was important in the cult around the Greek god Dionysus, as it was during religious Norse festivals such as Yule and Midsummer. Wine also plays a central role in Christian rituals, even today. Speaking of Christianity, some monastic communities, like the Trappists, are traditional producers of beer. Why is this so? Well, one of the reasons is that monks have a lot of time, and making beer takes time. Another reason is that during certain days and certain times of the year, they are only allowed to eat once per day. But the rules say nothing about drinking, and beer is very nourishing. Tips for tourists. Attending religious rituals should generally be avoided. If you must, try to stay discreet. And for goodness sake, don't bring any booze. Not all religions embrace alcohol, some, like Islam or Buddhism, strictly forbid it. Wine and beer are not the only alcoholic beverages. When you fill wine in bottles together with additional yeast and sugar, you can kick off the fermentation a second time. Due to the pressure, the resulting CO2 stays dissolved in the water. It's a bit tricky to get the yeast out, and you have to fill up the empty space with wine, but once you've done that you get a bottled beverage that starts sparkling when you open the bottle. This is called sparkling wine. You can also distill alcoholic beverages, just heat them such that the alcohol evaporates and the water stays behind, then cool the alcohol fumes down so they condense. This way you get beverages called liquor with not only a high amount of alcohol but also lots of other volatile chemicals. Earthlings love those volatile chemicals because they stimulate their noses. A lot of beverages are created this way, distilled wine is called brandy. Distilled fermented sugar water is rum and distilled beer is basically whiskey. The Chinese distill some kind of sorghum beer to obtain the popular liquor by Jio. You can ferment and distill pretty much anything that contains carbon hydrates, from agave plants to potatoes. As alcohol is a good solvent, you can also use distilled alcohol to extract flavors from whatever strange tasting thing you find in nature. A popular example is gin, which is made from juniper berries. Not surprisingly, this was first sold as medicine for problems like kidney ailments, lumbago, stomach ailments, gallstones, and gout. Interestingly, when you mix gin with tonic, a soda containing quinine, you get an actual medicine against malaria. This was used extensively by British colonial officers in India. In the words of Winston Churchill, the gin and tonic has saved more Englishmen's lives and minds than all the doctors in the empire. If earthlings ever colonize other planets with a carbon-based biosphere, you can be pretty sure that once their base is up and running, they will find all kinds of organisms with strong tastes and transform them into liquor, which they will sell on their home planet, first as quack medicine, then as a popular beverage for rituals. Now to another popular beverage, tea. It comes from a shrub plant called tea plant. The leaves of this shrub have been consumed as a vegetable in China since 6,000 years ago. They aren't very nutritious but contain a stimulant called caffeine. About 1,500 years ago, the Chinese discovered that you can get the stimulating effect without munching tea leaves when you mix the leaves with boiling water. This beverage is called tea. The consumption of tea is highly ritualized in China and Japan. When it reached Europe in the 1600s, it was first labeled a medical drink against headaches, colds, ophthalmia, catarrh, asthma, sluggishness of the stomach, and intestinal troubles. Tea was imported as a luxury beverage because China had a monopoly on tea production and intended to keep it. But the British carried out a covered operation to steal Chinese tea grains and smuggle them to their Indian colony. Soon, tea was imported in large quantities and became a beverage of the British working class, a mild productivity drug, like the ones used by the Union of Galactic Communist Republics. Today, tea is the planet's second most popular beverage, after water. Another popular hot drink is coffee. It comes from the fruit of the coffee plant, or rather from their seeds, called coffee beans. Those are pulped, dried, milled, roasted, transported around the planet, packaged, ground, infused with hot water and eventually thrown away. The remaining water is a blackish liquid called coffee. It tastes bitter and has no nutritional value, but it's one of the most popular beverages in the world. Why? Because it contains the same stimulating molecule as tea, caffeine. But how does caffeine work? It's a bit like Arcturian rock swarmers. Those space-dwelling petriverous hive minds have been domesticated by Arcturians, to mine asteroid fields and planetary rings. Each hive contains hundreds of swarmers, which can chew down entire asteroid fields. When a swarmer's energy is depleted, it flies back to the hive and docks at a sleeping port. 
when more than half of the swarm has docked, the hive calls the remaining swarmers back and goes into shutdown. Now, to increase the time the swarm is working, the Arcturians have found a simple trick, just block a lot of docking ports with drones, so the hive doesn't realize how many swarmers are depleted. This way, they scam the hive into using its last energy reserves. Caffeine works basically the same way. See, a caffeine molecule looks like a hexagon, and a pentagon smushed together. Where did we see that before? Right, those little cell batteries. Full batteries are called adenosine triphosphate, ATP, but when they are empty, all that remains is that odd molecule, adenosine. Empty batteries dock at adenosine receptors in the brain, which eventually triggers an urge to sleep in order to charge the batteries in the mitochondria. This is called tiredness. Now, because caffeine has a similar shape, it kinda fits into those receptors, but without triggering them. In consequence, the brain doesn't realize the body needs energy, and the earthling feels awake. So, drinking coffee doesn't actually provide energy, it only disables the brain's low energy alarm. Coffee comes originally from East Africa. It became popular in the Muslim world, during the Islamic Golden Age, where it was served in coffee houses. Coffee was called the milk of chess players and of thinkers. It spread to Europe in the 16th century via the Ottoman Empire. First considered a cure for nervous disorders, it soon became a popular drink like tea. Like their Muslim counterpart, European coffee houses became places of scientific and political discussion, much like the modern internet, but without the cats and the pawn. Today, coffee is, much like tea, a drink people consume in the morning and during working hours, to increase productivity. One could argue that every golden age of mankind was fueled by its own mind-altering beverage. The rise of the first civilizations in Sumer and Egypt was fueled by beer. The golden age of Greco-Roman antiquity was powered by wine rituals called symposia. The various Chinese golden ages were accompanied by tea and baijiu. Both the Islamic golden age and the age of enlightenment relied on caffeine-powered think tanks, the coffee houses. And so on. Throughout history, drinking mind-altering beverages seems to have boosted the emergence and exchange of new ideas. Or maybe discussing new ideas makes thirsty, I don't know. Alongside coffee and tea, there is another hot caffeine beverage which arrived in Europe around the same time, chocolate, a beverage made from cacao beans. Those beans contain theobromine, a milder variant of caffeine, as well as phenylethylamine, a weak variant of the stimulants amphetamine and methamphetamine, also known as meth. Chocolate was probably invented around 3,000 years ago in Central America. The Aztecs and Maya prepared it as a spicy, invigorating drink made of cacao beans, cornmeal and chili. The Aztecs consumed it at royal feasts and gave it to their soldiers. The Maya had even a god of chocolate, Ekchua, the black god. European conquerors brought it to Europe, where the recipe was changed from spicy to sweet. You will not be surprised when I tell you that it was first sold as a remedy for abdominal pain. Soon it became a popular luxury drink. 200 years ago, Europeans discovered how to separate the fat in cacao beans from the caffeine-rich cacao powder, and invented chocolate in solid form, as bars or tablets. Today, hot chocolate is an alternative to coffee or tea, albeit less popular than the solid variant. We talked about sodas before, carbonated sweet drinks, usually served cold. When you combine this concept with caffeine, you get another popular drink, Coca-Cola. This drink was invented in 1886 in North America, not as a refreshment, but, you might have guessed it, as a quack remedy for many diseases, including morphine addiction, indigestion, nerve disorders, headaches, and impotence. The original recipe contained wine, cocaine and caffeine from cola nuts. Some clients were concerned about those ingredients, so the wine was replaced with carbonated water and sugar. Eventually, the cocaine was also removed and the beverage was sold as a refreshing drink, and met a huge success. Today, Coca-Cola is sold worldwide, alongside a number of rival products, other similar cola drinks, as well as so-called energy drinks, which also contain caffeine, sugar and CO2. The term energy refers to the perceived energy boost caused by the caffeine, not to the actual energy provided in the form of sugar. Beer, wine, tea, coffee, chocolate, cola. All those beverages are variants of the same principle, mind-altering products consumed in liquid form, often in the context of rituals. But why do earthlings do that? Before we come back to that, an ad by our sponsor, the Sirius Staryards. For centuries, the Sirius Staryards have been a synonym for high-quality luxury starliners. 
However, some cycles ago, we made galactic headlines when the cloaking systems on one of our starliners failed close to an unadministrated native civilization. The savages detected it and took it for a rogue asteroid. Due to galactic regulations concerning the cultural contamination of native tribes, the ship and its passengers were stuck on a hyperbolic trajectory for quite a while. Whereas a prolonged free vacation on a lavish luxury liner might not be the worst of fates, our clients were not happy, and rightfully so. We had made a mistake, and we assumed the consequences. So, we gathered our best engineers and ship designers and went back to the drawing board. During half a decade, we crafted a completely new vision of interstellar luxury cruises, reuniting comfort, security, entertainment, and style. Now, we are proud to announce the next generation of luxury starliners. The Oumuamua 2 has three redundant cloaking systems, a low-radiation dark energy drive and long-range evacuation teleporters. And with anti-graph pool, casinos, hollow suites, customizable pleasure bots, a Sagittarian brandy bar and no less than 41 gourmet restaurants, you will wish your voyage would last a bit longer. Why do Earthlings love brain hacking beverages? Well, the beverage part is easy to explain, products consumed in liquid form enter the bloodstream relatively fast, without the need to inject caffeine or alcohol directly into the veins. But why would one want to hack their own brains? It has to do with the brain's reward system, the system that pushes Earthlings to do the bidding of the genetic imperative. Earthlings like to stimulate their reward system in different ways, doing something the genetic imperative demands, eating, reproducing, and not dying. Tricking the reward system with useless or simulated actions, like diet soda, porn, or video games. Hacking emotions by consuming art, like poetry, paintings, or music. Creating emotions with rituals, like religious services, socializing, or sports. Or simply directly hacking the brain chemistry with wine, coffee, coke etc. As you can imagine, hacking your own brain chemistry with alcohol or other drugs is dangerous and can, in extreme cases, lead to not eating, not reproducing, and dying. We will elaborate on that in another episode. But why are brain hacking drinks so closely related to rituals? Well, it's similar to the behavior of the chromatomorphs, who live in the lava swamps of Sirius II. They display their mood through colors. Their brains are basically hydraulic computers but can be influenced by chemicals found in lava fumes. Now, chromatomorphs are predators who hunt through telekinesis. Their telepathic power increases exponentially with their number. A pack of chromatomorphs can easily bring down a zeppelin whale or reel in a magma kraken, if they manage to cooperate. Unfortunately, chromatomorphs are quite quarrelsome and rarely agree on anything. That's where the lava fumes come in, to cooperate, the pack inhales some fumes which influence their brains and align their moods to the task at hand. This way they can cooperate and bring down a large prey, before disagreeing again on how to divide it. Drinks play a similar role in earthling rituals. When you have watched episode 11, you might remember that rituals are a substitute for telepathy, a way of synchronizing emotions, intentions, and group values. Now, emotions are closely linked to brain chemistry. So, earthlings may synchronize emotions by sharing a drink that hacks everybody's brain chemistry in the same way, just like the chromatomorphs do with the lava fumes. That's why many earthling rituals, from Greek symposia to modern construction work, are often boosted by moderate consumption of alcohol. That's why even more alcohol is consumed during celebrative rituals, from Babylonian feasts to modern wedding receptions. And that's why other rituals, from coffee house discussions to progress update meetings, call for the consumption of coffee or tea. As a rule of tentacle, caffeine rituals are often productive rituals which require a mind unclouded by tiredness, particularly in the workplace. On the other hand, alcohol rituals are generally more about celebrating, socializing and reinforcing group coherence, often in the evening, when the day's work is done and there is no need to stay alert. A great example would be business meetings. In Western countries, meetings between potential business partners are often fueled by coffee or tea, in order to get the sobriety to hammer out a contract. You may also meet for a business dinner where you may have a glass of wine or two, in order to socialize a bit. In contrast, Western business people who want to make a deal in China often find themselves in a carousal, with the expressed goal of building trust by getting dead drunk together. In Chinese business culture, personal relationships are more important than written contracts. This was the 18th episode of Earthlings 101. 
In the next episode, we will learn about time. What is time? How does Earthlings' perception of time differ from yours or mine? Why do they feel that time can speed up or slow down? And how do they measure it? So long, like, subscribe, and don't forget to be alien.